Hey everyone, Spicy Toast Gaming here, and today it's time for our max level relic build video. So we're gonna be going through every single champion, showcasing some of the best relics that you can use with that champion. Now I will be highlighting builds for both monthly challenges as well as some of the tougher adventures such as Aurelian Soul. That being said though, there are many different ways to build your champions. So just because I showcase a build here, doesn't mean that's necessarily the best build for all circumstances. I definitely encourage you all to still experiment and find what build you like best for each champion. These are just some of my recommendations. Now there's a lot of champions, so I'm gonna to try to do this fairly quickly, but just wanna give a massive shout out to all of my awesome members. If you wanna go that extra mile supporting the channel, hit that join button down below and let's get into it. Now up first, we have Aatrox. This is one build that can be fun to go with. If you wanted to use monthly adventures, just swap out the Bounty Hunters Renown for a different stat relic. But here, we're just trying to get a bunch of strikes off. Aatrox scales very well with multiple strikes, both healing up your Nexus and then reducing down other cards in your hand and reducing down the cost of his World Ender level up spell. So strikes are very good for Aatrox. So just mix and matching what strike relics you want to put on and then normally accompany it with a stat relic just to get the most bang for your buck. If you prefer to go a little bit slower with your game plan but want to scale up your Aatrox to ridiculous levels while also having massive amounts of removal, then you can go for something a little bit more like this. You have Archangel Staff, the Grand General's Counterplan, and the Berserker's Buckle. This works so well because your Grand General's Counterplan, it's going to be creating this Deathbringer sweep right here. Let's Aatrox and another unit strike each other. So Aatrox can kill a unit. He's gonna get eaten hit as well. That's gonna trigger your Berserker's Buckle, scaling him up a little bit more. And then once you use this, it's going to make a Deathbringer Slash. So essentially the same spell again just a little bit cheaper. And then it's even gonna go one further and creating another spell that does the same thing. So essentially you can get three strikes off from this, letting Aatrox take out three enemy targets and scale up so much with that Berserker's Buckle. Remember Aatrox gets regen from his equipment. So even if he gets low, he can scale back up to full HP, which will be much higher now after all of those strikes. Now, if you're playing a longer adventure, then you might want to swap out the Archangel Staff here for another Berserker's Buckle. Quite often you can get some powers like Wild Inspiration or Spell Slinger that will reduce down the spell you are generating and so you can get more scaling for the same amount of work. All right, that's it for Aatrox. Next up, Annie. Now this is going to be the only build I'm recommending for her. She is a one cost champion, so there's a lot of different ways you can build her as well as every one cost champion. But this is my go-to Annie build for all content in the game. Very simple and straightforward, but very effective. So we have the Archangel Staff, round start, refill your spell mana. Since she is a one cost, this is gonna be activating pretty much the entire game. Ludin's Tempest, all of your spells and skills deal one extra damage. This is essentially the exact same thing as her star powers. So you're just tripling down on what you're already trying to do. And then lastly, we have the Grand General's Counterplan. So round start, create a fleeting copy of me in hand. Now that fleeting copy, since you already have Annie on the board, is going to turn into her champion spell, which if we take a look at right here, is Disintegrate. Pick a unit, the next time it takes one or more damage this round, kill it. So this is a great way of dealing with massive enemy units. You put this on them and then just do any damage and it will kill them. And from her champion level ups, this actually gets a mana potion, so it goes down to a one cost, and it also has some draw on it. So what you can do with this is use it to pop spell shields, use it for just some extra draw, use it to help kill enemy targets, or if your Annie is at risk of dying, then you have an extra copy of her in your hand that you can easily play so you can always have your Annie on the board. And now because of that Archangel Staff, you'll still always have mana to play this one cost spell, so it really does a lot, and this build is just a wonderful all-purpose build for all content. Next up then, we have Ash. Now, similar to Annie, this is another great all-purpose build that you can use for both adventures or monthly challenges. And very similar to Annie, we have both Archangel Staff and the Grand General's Counterplan again, but here we have the Troll King's Crown. While Ash is on the board, she's refilling your spell mana and then generating Ash's champion spell, which is going to be this Flash Freeze. This Flash Freeze, also from your champion level ups, has the Hextech Fabricator on it, rank two. So when you play this, it's going to be giving one of your units a rare item, but that's not really why you're using this. You're just using to have another Frostbite so you can control the game even more. So this gives you a great amount of control. And then the Overwhelm is 
helping to mitigate one of Ash's biggest weaknesses, which is that she can be pretty slow for actually ending the game. So Troll King's Crown, it lets you still challenge enemy units, take them out, get that extra scaling from her second star power, but still be dealing damage to the enemy nexus at the same time. Without this, Ash games normally last quite a while, and so this is the build I've found that works very well for just all content in the game. Next then, we have Bard, also called Brad by some members of the community. Now this is a build I actually use on a couple different individuals, but I very much like it. So we have Corrupted Star Fragment, Support, Kill My Supported Ally, and Grant Me Its Keywords and Stats. Great way to put a lot of power into your Bard, really making him your win condition. Also note that all these stats you're giving a Bard count towards his level up condition, so this is even better for him than it is on some other champions. Then you have the Succubus Brand, 1-1, one, one, and when I kill a unit, I summon a random husk. This is great for two reasons. For one, the extra stats, while they're nice in their own right. For Bard, when you play a unit that has bonus stats, you're granting them two extra keywords. So you always want to be playing units that have those extra stats, but sometimes that can be hard at the very start of a game. So having extra stats on your champion by default means that whenever you play him, you're always guaranteeing that he gets those two keywords, which is very nice. And then since you're killing units from the Corrupted Star Fragment, you're able to generate a husk consistently, which can further help your scaling and your generation of keywords. Then lastly, we have Voidborn Carapace. So Evolve, when any unit dies, grant me its keywords. Again, a great way to get more keywords on Bard, as well as some extra stats. However, if you don't like playing with Voidborn Carapace, you could also throw on a Berserker's Buckle, that when he takes damage, he's granted 2-2. Those also contribute to his level up condition, and so that also can be a great upgrade. Now this build can work for all content in the game. That being said, this build doesn't necessarily rely on his chimes as much. So if you want to go for a chime heavy build, you can then just throw on Chameleon's Necklace for all of your slots to just fill your deck full of Bard, because if you take a look at him, round start, if you have three or more mana gems, plant a chime in your deck for each bard that started the game in your deck. So the more bards you have, the more chimes you're generating every round. So if you want to go for a crazy chime heavy build, just throw on a bunch of chameleon necklaces and have fun with that. It won't be as effective, but it can be quite fun. All right, up next then, we have Darius. So Darius is a very interesting one. He is a very aggressive set of star powers, but Darius himself is very expensive. So I actually like going for a very passive build with him. So I like running two Z Drive prototypes, start adventure with two plus rerolls, and then a Star Child Staff. With Darius, you often don't want your units to block because they have very high attack pools, but very weak health pools. And so you want them always to be attacking, not blocking. So the Star Child Staff helps mitigate that weakness of not blocking. And then with the Z Drive prototype, you're normally using those rerolls on support champions, and you're trying to get a very powerful one or two cost support champion that you then will put your upgrades in and use them to dominate the game. Now this is better for adventures where you can get a lot of champion upgrades and normally not something you're gonna wanna use for monthly challenges, although I did try it out in monthly challenges and it still worked out but it will be better for adventures. For monthly challenges, you probably wanna go something more similar to this, and you're normally gonna be playing him when there's modifiers that either have you start with full mana or will let you cheat out your Noxus cards a bit faster. So you go for the Gatebreaker. When I play, I strike the Nexus, the Warhammer to boost up that damage a little bit more, and then that Crown Guard Inheritance so that hopefully when he hits the Nexus, he's immediately gonna level up and you can rally and end the game. This can be a very strong build for certain monthly adventures, or monthly challenges, that is. All right, next up then, we have Diana, still rocking that Gale Force. Now, Gale Force is better for adventures when you can get some more champion nodes, and if you're doing adventures, you probably wanna switch out the Warhammer for the Bounty Hunter's Renown, that gives you that 1-1 one, one for every 200 gold you have. But for some monthly challenges, like for the past month, there was several that when you strike, you double your damage. Since when she's attacking, she has double attack and Gale Force, she's striking so many times that she can still OTK the enemy very easily. So if you see that modifier, definitely throw on your Gale Force Troll King's Crown really helps you push as much damage early, and then a Stat Relic is very effective because you're getting so many strikes off with your double attack and then your two attacks with Gale Force that any increase to your damage 
is greatly magnified. So having a stat relic is very good. If you don't like Gale Force though, or you don't have it, another great build you can go for is the Archangel Staff, Grand General's Counterplan, and the Troll King's Crown. The Overwhelm branded from this is very nice if you just wanna be very consistent and end games as fast as possible. Archangel Staff, refilling your spell mana, always pairs great with the Grand General's Counterplan. For Diana, the spell she's making is that Pale Cascade. So give an ally 1-1, one, one, decent combat trick. Nightfall, draw one, great way to get more Nightfall triggers, which can help you level up your Diana. But this also has the Hextech Fabricator rank two on it. So you can give your unit a rare item every time you play this. And then since this has some draw on it, you can very easily get to situations where you are just playing this, drawing another one, playing it, and just going crazy, buffing up your champion with all of these extra stats, as well as all the items you're putting on them. So another awesome play style you can go with Diana. All right, up next then, we have Echo with this awesome build that I'm very much been enjoying. So Stalker's Blade, when I'm summoned, I strike the weakest enemy. Echo has a strike effect of create a fleeting time trick in hand. So you see that right here, predict, then draw one. Echo is obviously a predict deck, so getting more of that is very strong. The Lost Chapter, when I'm summoned, refill your spell mana. So when you get that strike off, you'll always have the mana for that spell and then have some leftover mana for other spells as well. The Guardian Angel though is really what makes this for me. So you start adventures with one extra revive, always good to have, but then you have Last Breath. If it's the first time I've been slaying this game, revive me with one health. So when he revives, he immediately gets that strike off again and refills your spell mana again with that lost chapter. This does a lot of things for Echo. For one, you can play much more aggressively. Quite often with Echo, you're normally scared to take attacks because the enemy will be too powerful. So they'll they will just be able to block and kill you. Here, that doesn't really matter. And often the AI won't even want to block you because they know you'll be able to revive. So they actually sometimes avoid killing your Echo and will focus on your other cards instead. Also, Echo has several ways to summon other copies of himself. So here you have Parallel Convergence, start a free attack with an exact ephemeral copy of each ally. If your Echo is on the board, this is going to summon an ephemeral copy of him that will again get that strike off, which will then generate that time trick and refill your spell mana from that lost chapter. Or you have Chrono Break, revive all allies that died this round and rally. So even if your Echo dies, you have ways to then bring him back, triggering those strikes yet again. So very fun build, and this works great for both adventures and monthly challenges. If you want a little bit of a less aggressive playstyle though, but that's going to have some absolutely crazy combos, then this is another fun build. So Archangel Staff, we've been over it a couple times, you know what it does. The Grand General's Counter Plan for Echo, what that is going to do is going to make this called shot. Now this recently went up to focus speed, great quality of life buff right there, but two cost draw one, create a parallel convergence in your deck, as well as that Echo since it's his champion spell, that parallel convergence like we showed before, start a free attack with an exact ephemeral copy of each ally, this is a crazy spell and will often just flat out win you the game. So every round, because of that Grand General's Counter Plan, you're generating this, giving you some draw, and then creating those game ending spells in your deck that you can try fishing for with your predicts. And then the Chemtech Duplicator, so that when you hit that six mana, all of your spells will be doubled, which can be absolutely ridiculous with your Parallel Convergence or your Chrono Break, even doubling up on your predicts or doubling those crystals that the cat is making that are able to just deal board-wide damage to the entire enemy. I definitely wouldn't say this build is as efficient as the previous one, but it can be quite a lot of fun. All right, up next then, we have Elise. Now, this is a very similar build that we showcased earlier with Bard, but it works out very well for Elise. So support, kill my supported ally, grant me its stats and keywords. Since you can play Elise round one, you can have her constantly attacking, scaling up, and becoming an absolute monster. Void one Caracris, evolve, and when any unit dies, grant me its keywords. Again, great to get one, a strong keyword on Elise, as well as all the extra keywords from units dying. And remember, when Elise attacks, all of her keywords are also granted to all of your spiderlings. So Voidborn Carapace works very well here because getting all those keywords on her and then her spreading them out to your spider army is super effective. Then Succubus Brand 1-1, one, one, and when I kill a unit, summon a random husk. You're getting more stats. You're consistently generating these because of the Corrupted Star Fragment. And then those husks are giving you more scaling and even more keywords that you can then pass on to all your spider minions. 
very fun build and one you can definitely use for both adventures as well as monthly challenges. Next up then, we have Evelyn. Now for Evelyn, I like to go for a very simple approach of all of the level up relics. So when I level up, stun all enemies, Deceiver's Crest, when I level up, create a copy of my champion spell in hand, it costs zero this round, and Crown Guard Inheritance when I level up a rally. Let's touch on the Deceiver's Crest. When you level up, you're creating this right here. So stop all spells and skills targeting Evelyn, and then she strikes an enemy. So this works both as some protection for your Evelyn, as well as a good removal spell. And then the Tempest Blade and Crown Guard just stunning the entire enemy board, letting you rally and often end the game. Remember, Evelyn can level up essentially every single round, and every time she levels, she's granting all of your units everywhere 2-2. So very fun build, and lets Evelyn just dominate the game. Great again for both monthly challenges and any adventures. All right, next up then, we have Garen. So Garen from his star powers scales with getting strikes off. His level up condition is also I've struck twice. So I personally like to go for two strike relics. Here I'm using Stalker's Blade and Gatebreaker, and then also a stat relic. I just tried him out for some monthly challenges, so that's why I have the Warhammer here, but you probably wanna use Bounty Hunter's Noun if you're going through a adventure. Now I really like the strike play style. So yeah, this is the build I use for both adventures, and challenges, but if you wanted, you could swap out this Warhammer for a Crown Guard Inheritance, so that when he levels up Rally, that way you can play him, immediately level him up from the two Strike Relics, Rally, and then attack with your full board, trying to end the game. Very strong, but simple build, which I feel like is perfect for Garen, as that perfectly matches his character. All right, next then, we have Nar. So for Nar, I like to use the Scourge of Stash, Plunder, I cost two less, Dreadway Chase Gun, when I'm summoned, create two warning shots in hand. So that's right here, zero cost, deal one to the enemy nexus. And then some amount of stat relic. If you're doing monthly challenges, probably use the Warhammer. If you're going through an adventure, probably want to use the Bounty Hunter's Renown. Now he's a four cost champion with just a three, three stat line. So that's pretty bad. That's why we're both using a stat relic on him as well as the Scourge's Stash to try to cheat him out a little bit earlier. Now for Nar, his entire game plan is hitting the enemy Nexus. You want to do that at least once every single round. So the Plunder is normally pretty easy to get off for you. And that's also what the warning shots are for, is once you play Nar, this is a free way to hit the enemy Nexus. So on turns where you're not able to hit it any other way, you have this free way to hit it, trigger your star powers to keep scaling up. Very strong build and really lets you put the pressure on early. And it's again, my go-to for either monthly challenges or adventures. All right, next let's take a look at Gwen. Again, this is going to be a build that's my go-to for both adventures as well as monthly challenges. So first, Crown Guard Inheritance when I level up Rally. She levels up from attacking or doing damage. So it's very easy to attack. Use up your attack token, but then level up, getting another attack token so you can immediately attack again. Now, when she attacks, she gets a large stat boost from the Hallowed buff. That's what her whole kit is built around, and those buffs only last for the round. But since you leveled up from your first attack and got buffed the first time, you then can attack again, stacking that buff on top of itself so you actually have a just ridiculous amount of attack or power, which is great for ending the game. With that, we're pairing it with a Ludin's Tempest. All of your spells and skills deal one extra damage. So she has a skill that triggers and it's based on her attack power. So since we have this massive attack power from attacking twice in one round, her skill is also going to deal a massive amount of damage. The thing is that skill deals damage in increments of one. So Ludin's Tempest, by adding one extra damage to every increment of that spell, doubles your damage, making this deal crazy amount of damage as well as healing your Nexus. And then the Troll King's Crown, allies have Overwhelm. This is just making sure that massive amount of power you have isn't wasted by being blocked by like a 1-1 minion you're still punching through and hitting the enemy nexus. This is an absolutely amazing build and I highly recommend it for any content you're doing in the game. All right, next up then, we have Alawi. Now Alawi and Gwen actually play very similar to each other. So Alawi's level up is I've seen myself or tentacles deal 15 plus damage. This means you're normally gonna level up when you're attacking, which means you can attack, level up, rally from Crown Guard Inheritance, and then attack again, ending the game. Now with Crown Guard Inheritance, it's very good to pair it with one of these two relics. So the Troll King's Crown is a great upgrade, giving all of your allies Overwhelm. 
very strong, especially for your massive tentacle, because it doesn't normally have a way to punch through and hit the enemy nexus. So making that have Overwhelm is very strong, but then even with that, the Green Glade Shade Leaf support, grant my supported ally elusive, very strong on Alawi, since you can give your tentacle that elusive, letting it slip by the enemy and deal massive damage to the Nexus. Now for the third slot, you could put in either the Berserker's Buckle, when I survive damage, grant me 2-2. Two, two. Alawi's big and tanky with a very large health pool, so she can take some hits and scale up even more or you can just go for a stat relic to try to end the game as fast as possible. Again, a very solid build that works no matter what content you're doing. And I really like how it utilizes one relic that's not really used pretty much anywhere else in the game, that being Shade Leaf. If you haven't tried it on Alawi before, definitely give it a shot. It works very well. Also, if you just want to go more for the memes, you can use the Corrupted Star Fragment on her to just consume your tentacle and put all the stats on her. That's not optimal in most situations, but it can be quite fun to do and definitely worth trying out. All right, up next then, we have Jack, another champion that I love to run Strike Relics on. So here we're going double Strike Relics as, as well as a Stat Relic. As you see for Jack, strike, create a coin in hand. When you refill mana, heal me one for each mana refilled. And then also from his star powers, when you refill mana, you also deal damage to all the enemy units. So striking, getting those coins, letting you then refill your mana so you can play other units as well as triggering these other effects is very strong, which is why I like running the strike relics on him. Also Lost Chapter is another great selection. So when I'm summoned to refill your spell mana, since you're refilling your mana, you're again triggering all of those effects, in addition to just having some nice convenience of having your spell mana refilled. But double strike relics and a stat relic is my go-to for both adventures as well as monthly challenges. All right, next up then, we have Janna. So for Janna, I like going very much for a burn damage sort of playstyle. So first we have the Scourge of Stash, Plunder, I cost two less. Very easy to get this effect off, especially with your Ballistic Bot in your starting deck. And then since you're playing her for cheaper, that triggers all of your star powers that all deal with cost reduction. Luden's Tempest, all of your spells and skills deal one extra damage. She has a lot of spells that deal damage to both an enemy target as well as the enemy Nexus. Both of those damages are getting increased by the Luden's Tempest. And so it gives you a very fun burn damage playstyle. Then the Chemtech Duplicator, when you play a spell, if you have six or more mana gems, copy it with the same targets. Normally your games are lasting till that six mana anyways. So having all of your spells go off twice and then having all of their damage be increased by the Luden's Tempest gives you a very fun removal slash burn damage playstyle that I very much enjoy. And again, this works for both monthly challenges as well as adventures. All right, next up then, we have Jax. So for Jax, I like to run Crown Guard Inheritance stat relic and then the troll king's crown since you're a two mana champion and you have a very aggressive play style i want to try to be ending games as fast as possible and that's what this build is built around one stat relic is just giving you some more damage and some more survivability you are pretty fragile with just having two health baseline so anything that can increase that is very helpful now Jax does have some good scaling so every time he's attacking he's just getting stronger and stronger that Troll King's Crown really letting you and your units try to rush down the enemy as fast as possible and not having to worry about getting blocked out. And then that Crown Guard Inheritance with Jax, you're normally able to level up in the first or second attack. So then you can immediately attack again and often end the game. This is a great aggressive play style that again, works for both adventures and monthly challenges. You just need to change out your stat relic based on what one you are playing. All right, next let's take a look at Jin. For Jin, I like to go for a very wombo combo type of playstyle. So we have Tempest Blade when I level up Stun All Enemies, Crown Guard Inheritance when I level up Rally, and then Riptide Battery, Plunder, play Cannon Barrage a number of times equal to my cost. Now this works so well for Jin because Riptide Battery, this is a skill. For Jin, his star powers are all based around playing skills, including his level up condition. So what normally happens is you get to that four mana, you trigger your plunder effect by dealing any damage to the enemy Nexus. Jin has a decent amount of ways to do that, so that's not too hard. Then you play him, Riptide Battery goes off, which scales your Jin up a great amount, triggers all your star powers, and then he stuns all enemies 
rallies, and then normally that attack is enough to clear the enemy board and end the game. Now, if you have two Riptide batteries, you could potentially put in two of those and then either go for a Tempest Blade or a Crown Guard Inheritance. I only have one Riptide battery, but I like this setup as it is. And again, it's my go-to for both adventures as well as monthly challenges. Next up then, we have Jinx. Now for Jinx, I like to go for the Scourge of Stash. Plunder, I cost two less. Pretty much the easiest plunder effect in the game to get off. You just have to play anything and it'll get that Nexus damage. Dreadweight Chase Gun, important to have this before your Loose Cannon's Payload, but when I'm summoned, create two Warning Shots in hand. Then loose cannons payload, when I'm summoned, discard your hand, then create that many pow pows in hand. Those pow pows you see right here deal three to a unit. This is a very strong build and lets you end games incredibly quickly. What you can normally do is just pass your first turn, bank that spell mana, and then on your second turn, play your jury rig, which is a one cost burst spell that has farsight, so you're always gonna have that in your opening hand. You play that, it triggers your plunder effect. You then play Jinx, she discards her entire hand, makes that many pow pows, as well as two of her super mega death rockets. And you have enough mana left over to play both of those death rockets, which are fleeting to deal massive damage to the enemy and anything left on the board. It's a very strong build and also very mindless and is my go-to for when I need to just clear out some daily missions, but I don't really want to think about what I'm playing. Great build for any content in the game. Highly recommend checking it out. All right, next up then, we have Kai'Sa. So for Kai'Sa, I like going Lorient Blade Rack. Allies have Challenger, Troll King's Crown, Allies have Overwhelm. Then the Ludens Tempest, all of your spells and skills deal one extra damage. Now for Kai'Sa, she is all about having your units have keywords. So with both Blade Rack and Troll King's Crown, while they are powerful effects on their own, just giving all of your units keywords is great for triggering your evolve as well as just giving them all stats because as long as your units have three keywords, they're given two, two from your star powers. So with these, your units just have to have one other keyword, which normally they can have to get some good stat increases. Now the Ludin's Tempest, similar to Gwen, Kaisa has a skill that when she attacks, it deals damage in increments of one. So Ludin's Tempest essentially doubles the damage of your attack, which can often let you just clear the entire board. Very strong setup, and again, works for both monthly challenges as well as any adventures. All right, next up then, we have Kane. Now for Kane, it's nice to go double Stalker's Blade, as well as a Stat Relic. By default, you only have two attack, which is pretty ridiculously low, so boosting that up at all will really help you get more kills. Kane scales off of getting kills, so double Stalker's Blade almost guarantees that you'll at least kill one target, but potentially kill two targets. And this works out quite well, because you can play Kane, he'll get double strikes off, scale up because of those, get recalled because you leveled him up. You can then immediately play him again. Both those strikes will go off again, scaling you up even more, setting you up in a great position for the rest of the game. So it is quite simple to many other builds, but it is still very effective. And again, this works great in both adventures or monthly challenges. Just use your stat relic accordingly. Next then, let's take a look at Kindred. So for Kindred, I like running Guardian Angel, start adventures with one extra revive, very nice. Last breath, if it's the first time you've been slayed in this game, revive me with one health. Then pair that with double Stalker's Blade, this works out very well because Kindred is able to generate the spell Spirit Journey as part of her star powers, which lets you kill a unit and then revive it. This pairs very well with Guardian Angel because it both counts as killing your unit, so your unit then respawns, getting both the strikes from Stalker's Blade off, but it then revives the unit still with the Guardian Angel not triggered, so you can then do the combo again or just have the freedom to know that your Kindred can still take a Fatal Blow and still revive. Now, if you want, you could switch out one of these Stalker's Blades for a Lost Chapter to refill your spell mana every time you play Kindred. I like going for the Double Stalker's Blade, though. This gives you an absolute massive amount of removal so that once you have Kindred on the board, it almost guarantees the enemy won't be able to have anything on their side of the board. Very powerful effect. And again, one that works in both monthly challenges as well as adventures. All right, next up then, we have LeBlanc, one of the strongest and most versatile champions in the game. There is so many different ways to build her. 
pretty much you can throw any build on her and it will work. So definitely play around with whatever you like. She can work with just about every build. Some items though I want to shout out for her. Guardian's Orb, when I'm summoned, grant epic items to three random cards in your deck. You're able to summon a whole bunch of LeBlancs. You can get this to trigger many, many times, which can be a very fun play style. Stalker's Blade, when I'm summoned, I strike the weakest enemy. Again, you're able to summon her many times. You can get many different strikes off with that. And then the Lost Chapter, when I'm summoned, refill your spell mana. You're probably seeing a theme here, but since she can be summoned so many times, again, Lost Chapter is great and can really give you a infinite combo because LeBlanc, once she's leveled up, she's able to generate this image, pick an ally, summon a exact ephemeral copy of it. So you can use this on your LeBlanc. She can then strike an enemy. And then as long as she does enough damage, LeBlanc will make another one of these. And then if you have Lost Chapter, every time you play the spell, it's going to be refilling your mana so you can play it again. So yeah, potentially infinite combos you can do here. A lot of different ways you can play LeBlanc and she can really target whatever playstyle you want to go towards. These are some very powerful items on her. If you just want to go double or even triple Guardian's Orb, that would definitely work. If you want to go double Stalker's Blade in like a Lost Chapter, that would also very much work. Many different ways you can play her though, and this is one that I highly recommend experimenting with, and you'll have so much fun doing so. All right, next up then, we have Lee Sin. Now this is a build I specifically like to do in monthly challenges, especially when the adventure lets you start off with 10 mana. So Troll King's Crown, allies have Overwhelm, very powerful for Lee Sin because this essentially doubles your damage. When he levels up, he Dragon's Rage enemies that I challenge. So that Dragon's Rage, kick an ally into the Nexus, striking both, and then if the enemy survives, recall it. So with that kick, you're dealing your damage to the Nexus, but then since you're recalling your target, that normally fizzles your attack. If you have Overwhelm though, you'll still attack as well, essentially attacking twice, dealing massive damage. That's why Overwhelm is so good on Lee Sin. Chemtech Duplicator, good on Lee Sin in general, especially since he's at that 5 mana. So normally, right after you play him, this is going to activate anyways. When you play a spell, if you have 6 or more mana gems, copy it with the same targets, essentially doubling all your spells. And then the Hymn of Valor, when I'm summoned, create a redoubled Valor in hand, it costs 3. So that redoubled Valor, fully heal an ally, then double its power and health. So this is very fun to do, especially when you start off with 10 spell mana, or when you start off with 10 mana, because you can play Lee Sin with that Chemtech Duplicator, you can normally level up, level him up in the very first round. With his star powers, you can temporarily give an ally 8-8. So what you can do is buff up your Lee Sin with that 8-8 in stats. Normally also buff him up with those twin disciplines you can also generate from your star powers. And then with all of those extra stats, you play the redoubled Valor, doubling his stats even with all of those temporary stats. This is then going off twice with your Chemtech Duplicator, giving you a ridiculously sized Lee Sin. You then challenge a unit, making you kick them into the Nexus, but then because of your Overwhelm, you hit the Nexus as well. This is a very powerful combo that I definitely recommend using, especially for monthly challenges, as it will essentially just let you one-shot the enemy Nexus, and it's very fun to do. And while this build is amazing for monthly challenges, it is still good in adventures and will let you win the game shortly after hitting that six mana point. All right, up next then, we have Leona. So for Leona, I like using Troll King's Crown. Allies have Overwhelm. The Grand General's Counterplan, Round Start, create a fleeting copy of me in hand. And then the Archangel's Staff. Now the spell you're creating with that Grand General's Counterplan, right here, give allies 1-1 one, one this round. Activate an ally's Daybreak effect. Now this is very strong because of your star powers where when you activate a daybreak effect, you're giving your whole board while well, granting them 1-1. One, one. So this is giving them all 1-1 one, one from the effect, but then since you're activating a daybreak, you're granting them all 1-1. One, one. An activate and daybreak effect can be very strong. Normally you can use that to trigger a stun. And then Leona, if she's leveled up, daybreak or when you activate another daybreak, stun the strongest enemy. So what you can normally do is you can have your bird on the board. You can use this on the bird to trigger its daybreak effect. It will stun an enemy. Leona will then stun another enemy because you triggered another daybreak. So generating one of these every single round gives you a great amount of control, but then also an amazing amount of scaling. And then since it's that three mana cost, it works perfectly with your Archangel staff. So you'll always have enough mana to play this. And since you have so much scaling going on, 
you have that overwhelm to make sure you can actually end the game. Now that being said, you could swap out the Troll King's Crown for a Chemtech Duplicator. Normally you're able to stun most targets, so you don't have any blockers anyways. And so Chemtech Duplicator, when you get those spells off twice, can also be a very strong effect since you're playing Leona on turn five. So it's just the next turn that Chemtech Duplicator comes online. And this is a great build to go with, again, both for monthly challenges as well as your adventures. All right, then let's go take a look at Lux. Now there's a lot of different ways you can build Lux. If you wanna focus on the champion herself, this is a decent option. So Chemtech Duplicator, doubling all your spells, very good, especially for a spells-based deck like Lux. Archangel Staff, refilling your spell mana. Again, great for a spells-based deck. And then Arcane Comet, round start, create a fleeting, falling comet in hand. So that six cost spell, obliterate a unit or a landmark. So this obviously gives you some great amount of removal. And then Lux, she's all about playing six mana spells. So that Fallen Comet works great there. However, the build I normally like to go for a little bit more with her when I'm wanting to focus on her champion is swapping that last relic out for a Scourge's Stash so I can try to play her a little bit earlier so I can get her leveling up and generating those final sparks a little bit faster and get benefit from that Archangel Staff even earlier. Lux though is one of those champions that you don't actually ever need to play the champion and you can still do incredibly well. So going for a reroll build for her with the Cardmaster's Gambit and the Z Drive prototype actually works quite well. So the Cardmaster's Gambit 1-1 one, one, and when you win a adventure without taking any Nexus damage, earn one reroll. Now Lux is actually able to do that fairly consistently. So this can give you a good amount of rerolls then the Z Drive prototype as well, start adventures with two more rerolls. Very solid. With Lux, you're really trying to fish for just a couple powers, specifically sorcery. So round start, refill your spell mana. And then also slow but steady, so all your slow spells are doubled. That's really what you're looking for for powers. So having some extra rerolls to try to get those powers is actually very strong. Now this obviously is only good for adventures. You don't really wanna go for the reroll build for monthly challenges, but quite often you can actually end the game on turn five. So instead of playing your Lux, you normally can play a couple spells, get a couple rallies going and end the game. So while it can be fun to play with Lux the champion herself, she is one of the few champions where that's really not necessary. And so it would be quite nice to just focus on your star powers and your starting deck and just let your champion be giving you some passive buffs because all of these don't require Lux to ever be on the board to take effect. All right, next up then, we have Master Yi with a build that works great in both adventures and monthly challenges. So Crown Guard Inheritance, when I level up Rally, the Grand General's Counterplan, Round Start, create a fleeting copy of me in hand, and the Archangel Staff. At this point, you know what the Archangel Staff does. The Grand General's Counterplan, this is especially good on Master Yi, because this allows you to essentially do a near infinite cycle. So it creates a Wuju style in hand. Now from your champion level ups, this has a hero's horn on it. That means it draws a champion when you play this. So you play this, you give an ally two power, you create a meditate in hand, create a master Yi in your deck. And then because of the hero's horn, you're gonna draw another champion. Now very quickly, you'll draw the other copies of whatever your support champion is. So you'll just be left with Master Yi. So when you play this, you're immediately going to draw another Master Yi after putting a Master Yi in your deck. So you can just keep playing this forever as long as you have the mana. Now this also is creating this Meditate in hand. So two cost burst, given ally two power. Very important because Master Yi is all about the flow effect, as you see right here, of playing two spells in a single round. So creating that Grand General's Counter Plan or creating that spell very strong effect. Also, Crown Guard Inheritance is very good for you because with Master Yi, you're playing all of these combat tricks to buff up his damage. So normally you can perfectly trigger your level up when you want. Normally when you have a ridiculous amount of temporary stats. So you attack with all these temporary stats that are only gonna last for the round, but then you level up, you rally because the Crown Guard Inheritance, and then you can immediately attack again, ending the game. Very powerful combo and really lets you end the game, normally the round after you play Master Yi. Again, great for monthly challenges as well as adventures. Highly recommend giving it a try. And let's move on to Miss Fortune. 
So for Misfortune, I like running the Scourge of Stash. Plunder, I cost two less. Misfortune can easily trigger that uh, Plunder effect. She's making a Powder Monkey every single round. That when it dies, it deals one damage to the enemy Nexus. So you can normally play her for very cheap, trying to get her out as early as possible. The Blade Rack, allies have Challenger. Normally you're flooding your board. You have a very Swarm style play style. And so those units normally don't have that much damage. So Overwhelm isn't as important as making sure they're challenging the right targets and getting the best attacks possible. And then Misfortune does have a pretty weak stat pool. So throwing on a stat relic just to help her out a little bit can be quite helpful. Now this is decent for both monthly challenges as well as adventures. But for some situations, you're going to want to go for something a little bit different. You can also go more of a Spellslinger deck with Misfortune going Archangel Staff, Luden's Tempest, and the Grand General's Counterplan. Now the Grand General's Counterplan does this right here, make it rain, deal one damage to three different randomly targeted enemies or the enemy Nexus. Now, since that's only dealing one damage each, Luden's Tempest by adding one damage is actually doubling the damage you're dealing. Also when Misfortune attacks, she does bullet time, deal one damage three times to all battling enemies and the enemy Nexus. So since all of her attacks and skills are dealing one damage, but perhaps dealing one damage several times, Luden's Tempest is giving you a lot of extra damage. There are some situations where you're wanting to do a lot more of that poke damage and just getting rid of a lot of small targets, or for some monthly challenges, if you just deal damage to the enemy, they'll die at the end of the round. So in situations like that, this build can really shine. Most situations though, I'd recommend going for the first build I showcased here though. All right, next up then, we have Nami. Now for Nami, we're running with Troll King's Crown, Allies of Overwhelm. We're buffing our unit stats up to pretty crazy amounts. So Overwhelm lets us end games very quickly. Chemtech Duplicator, this is gonna be situational. It's great for when you were leveling her up, but normally when you're maxed out, you're ending games before you get to that six mana. And then the Grand General's counter plan, round start, create a fleeting copy of me in hand. That's gonna be Nami's ebb, which once you play this, it then makes the flow. Once you play this, it then gives you the ebb and flow. This is great for giving you some extra damage as well as a bit of sustain, either for your Nexus or some of your units. But really, you're just trying to play a whole bunch of spells because every time you play spells, Nami's buffing up your whole board. Well, your board one at a time. And Nami can very quickly go infinite with spells. So very simple but powerful combo. Again, though, Chemtech Duplicator, very strong, but you likely will find yourself being able to end games before you hit that six mana. So if you find yourself consistently doing that, you will want to switch this out. You could switch it out for a stat relic to make Nami a little bit tankier. You could put in a Luden's Tempest to make all of your ebbs and flows deal a little bit of extra damage. Or you could go for a Crown Guard Inheritance to try to rally when you level up and just end the game as soon as possible. A lot of different ways you can go with that, but again, this is a build that works both for your monthly challenges as well as any adventures. All right, next then, we have Nasus. Now for Nasus, there's a couple different ways you can go with him. The Scourge is Stash, trying to get him out a little bit earlier, not too bad. Gatebreaker can be a decent choice. This is actually his relic after all. So pairing that with a stat relic so that when you play him, he just ends the game for you. Or you could try to go for a little bit slower of a scaling approach with Archangel Staff and the Grand General's counter plan. So you're refilling your mana every single round and then you can consistently be playing your Siphoning Strike. Now this goes down to a three cost from your level ups, letting an ally strike a unit, essentially getting a kill off, which can then trigger your slay effects, buffing up your Nasus, but then also it's granting allied champions everywhere 2-2, further buffing up your Nasus. Can be a very fun play style to try to get him on the board early, and then use this to just scale him up, taking out enemy targets consistently. So either going for this or just going for a stat build with Gatebreaker to have him be your finisher, also a solid option. Or you could try to put a Stalker's Blade on him so that when you play him, he's able to hit an enemy unit, hopefully killing them, again, helping himself scale up. And these builds would work for both monthly challenges as well as adventures. That being said though, Nasus is one of the weakest champions in the game, so I wouldn't really recommend him for monthly challenges in most situations. All right, next up then, we have Nico. So for Nico, she's another one that you're able to summon herself many times. So going for Double Guardian's Orb and Lost Chapter can actually be quite strong on her. So the Double Guardian Orbs, when I'm summoned, grant epic items to three random cards in your deck. And then the Lost Chapter, this is so that when you play your Shape Splitter, Nico's Champion spell, 
you're summoning another copy of her. That's triggering the Guardian Orbs as well as the Lost Chapter. Refilling your spell mana so you can keep playing that spell again. And normally get a couple Nikos out in the very first couple of rounds. Flooding your deck with epic items and using that to end the game shortly thereafter. It's both a very fun play style, but actually surprisingly strong as well. Definitely one to check out in both adventures as well as monthly challenges. All right, next up then, we have Nidalee. Very fun champion, and she's one that actually has a very, well not a very different, a slightly different build based on what content you're doing. So here, this is what I'd recommend for monthly challenges. You have Crown Guard Inheritance, my level up rally, Troll King's Crown, Allies of Overwhelm, and then the Lost Chapter. So you're able to play Nidalee as Ambush 2, so you can play her round one. When you play her, it triggers her Lost Chapter, refilling your spell mana so that you can play her Ambush spell, immediately transforming her from the bush into Nidalee. You then attack, dealing a massive amount of damage, especially with that Troll King's Crown, so you can't even get blocked out. And then normally, the next round, when it's the enemy's turn to attack, you can then level up, rallying and finishing off the game. Very strong build and definitely a champion to help you with some of those stronger monthly challenges. Now, if you're an adventure though, it's actually better to just put on a stat relic. Normally you don't need to go for the rally because with those extra stats, you can just end the game in your very first attack and you don't actually need to trigger those rallies. So it works essentially the same, it's just a little bit stronger because you can scale her up higher throughout the course of an adventure. So this is the build I'd recommend for adventures. The previous build is the one I'd recommend for your monthly challenges. All right, next up then, we have Neela. Now, Neela as a two cost champion, there's a lot of different ways to build her. Some of the relics I like to go with though, the Grave Digger Spade, round start, draw one, give it fleeting. Great for Neela as she needs those fleeting cards to trigger her star powers and get her duplication off. Corrupted Star Fragment, support, kill my supported ally and grant me its keywords and stats. Neela can really struggle with closing out games. This is really helpful for making Neela your game finisher. You have some decent elusives and overwhelm units in your deck. So being able to consume those on Neela, getting all those stats with those strong keywords and using her to end the game is quite effective. And then a stat relic just to help her be even more aggressive in that early game and rush down the enemy. A very strong build no matter what content you're doing in the game. But again, as a two cost champion, there's a lot of different ways you can build this champ. All right, moving on then, we have Orn, A very awesome champion, but one that's often at the bottom of the tier list. Now, a couple different ways you can play him one, very simple and straightforward. You just put a bunch of stat relics on him and then Gatebreaker. And then by the time you're able to play him, hopefully the Nexus is low enough. You just play Orn and he just one shots the enemy Nexus. Very simple, but it is effective. Now, the more fun way to play him is with Gale Force, Corrupted Star Fragment, and then also a stat relic. Now, normally Orn is going to be leveled up when you play him. When he's leveled up, when he attacks, he creates a ram that has all of the stats of Orn. Now that ram also has Overwhelm. So what you can do is you attack with Gale Force. Orn creates a ram that has all of his stats. You then consume the ram, essentially doubling your stats with that Corrupted Star Fragment. If the enemy is still somehow alive, that was just your scout attack. Now you can attack again, summoning another ram consuming it again, doubling your stats a second time, and again, dealing absolutely massive amounts of damage. Now, this isn't foolproof. You can get stunned or people can ruin your combo, but it is hilarious to do and definitely a combo I recommend you checking out if you want to have a good time. Now, either of these builds can work in adventures or monthly challenges. Again, though, similar to Nasus, Orn is on the weaker side, so definitely be careful if you're using him in monthly challenges. Next up then, we have Pike. So Pike, another champion that's great to have double strike relics as well as a stat relic. For Pike, his level up condition is allied pikes have dealt 15 or more damage. So even if your Pike gets recalled, this level up condition is just shared between all of them. Now, once he levels up, when I kill an enemy, I strike the weakest enemy. So essentially, once he's leveled up, he can then wipe the enemy board every time he kills a unit. A very strong and powerful effect, and that's why we like to go for the double strike relics as well as a stat relic on him. So that you play him, 
he hits the Nexus, getting a good amount for his level up. He then hits a unit, and then if that strike was a kill and enough to level him up, he'll then start chaining kills to every unit on the enemy board. Now, if you want, you could run Double Stalker's Blade. I personally like having one Gatebreaker in there, but that's personal preference. And this is a very solid build for both monthly challenges as well as adventures. Now, with Pike, you do have ways to recall him. His Bone Skewer lets you strike a unit. Again, a strike getting more damage off, very good. But then it moves your Pike to the top of your deck. Therefore, you can play him again, triggering all of these again. So it really is a great build for him. Moving on then, we have Samira. Now for Samira, I like to go for the Dreadway Chase Gun. When I'm summoned, create two warning shots in hand. Those warning shots, zero cost, deal one to the enemy Nexus. Crown Guard Inheritance when I level up Rally. And then the Troll King's Crown allies have Overwhelm. Now for Samira, you need to have triggers for hitting the enemy Nexus to trigger your cost reduction. Dreadway Chase Gun is great for that. Also for Samira, you're trying to level her up in the first couple rounds. And to do that, you need to play a bunch of cards. Dreadway Chase Gun, again, great for that as there are zero cost burst speed cards. When she levels up, it's great to have that rally. Really lets you put the pressure on, often ending the game. And then the Troll King's Crown, great for just trying to push your advantage. Again, making sure you can't get blocked out and dealing a lot of damage to the Nexus. Now, if you're Samira, if you find she's a little bit too squishy and not scaling up fast enough, you can switch this out for a stat relic, but in most situations, having that overwhelm will be very strong. For Samira, she's a very aggressive champion that wants to be ending games as fast as possible. And this build is really leaning into what she wants to be doing and is great for both adventures and monthly challenges, really helping you end matches as fast as you can. Next up then, we have Set. Now for Set, I like going Chemtech Duplicator, when you play a spell, if you have six or more mana gems, copy with the same target. You're playing him for five mana, so next round this starts triggering. Grand General's Counter Plan, that's going to be creating a face breaker for you. Stun two enemies, create a coin in hand. This gives you a great amount of control, and then also more coins, which these are doubled by the Duplicator, really letting you go crazy once you hit that six mana. And then the Archangel Staff, just to make sure you have enough mana to play what you need. For Set, he's all about spending mana, generating coins. And by doing that from his star powers, you're able to scale up your board as well as trigger rallies. So being able to double your spells, which doubles the amount of coins you're generating, and then being able to double your coins themselves, so when you play them, they go off for twice the effect from that Chemtech Duplicator. It's a very powerful build and it really lets you end games as soon as you hit that six mana. Definitely recommend checking it out for both adventures as well as challenges. Next up then, we have Tom Kench. Now for Tom Kench, I really love running the Berserker's Buckle. When I survive damage, grant me 2-2. Two, two. Now this is the same effect as his star powers, so you're able to scale Tom Kench up like crazy. Also, I find it's good to put in a Troll King's Crown, because with all these stats you have, without the Troll King's Crown, normally games will just go on too long. And so while it's fun to run Triple Berserker's Buckle, and I've done it many times, I normally regret it and really wish I put on that Troll King's Crown. Now with Tom Kench, since he's able to create those acquired taste, capturing enemy units but first they strike him, you have a way to make sure you're getting hit every single round triggering these Berserker's Buckle, as well as your star powers, really helping you scale up to a ridiculous amount. So very simple, but strong build that can work for any content. If you want to go for more of a cloning playstyle, though, you can go for a build a bit more like this. If you don't know, every time Tom Kench captures a unit, he creates a copy of it in hand that he can then play. So the Grand General's Counter Plan, that makes your Bayou Brunch, then you capture an ally. And now you gain all the captured allies' stats, but you're also creating a copy of it in hand from your star powers. So you can capture enemy units with your acquired taste and then capture your own units with the Bayou Brunch. This lets you go crazy cloning units if you want, since you'll always have mana for that Bayou Brunch with that Archangel Staff and Grand General's Counter Plan. Still having one Berserker's Buckle though, just so you gain even more scaling. While this is not as effective of a build, again, it is a lot of fun to play around with. Next up then, we have Talia. So Talia, I like to run Crown Guard Inheritance when I level up Rally. Quite often, you can level up Talia the same round that you play her, so she can be a very strong finisher for you. 
than the Blade Rack Allies have Challenger. Now from your star powers, all of your units already have Overwhelm, so making sure everyone is taking the best possible engagements from that Challenger is very nice to have. And then throwing on a Stat Relic, making her as big of a threat as possible. Again, a very solid build for both adventures as well as challenges. If you find yourself consistently running out of space though, you can go for a Corrupted Star Fragment to try to make some extra room on your board, but I often find just going for a Stat Relic works just as well. Next then, let's take a look at Teemo. Now, Teemo is actually still quite powerful, and for Teemo, I like to run the Gatebreaker, Crown Guard Inheritance, and then a Stat Relic. Now, normally how this works out is you play Teemo, he immediately hits the Nexus, and then when you attack with him, from his star powers, before he even hits the Nexus, he levels up, triggering your Crown Guard Inheritance, letting you rally, so you can attack twice, doubling those puff caps twice, and it's still actually a very powerful build. Now, I will say this build does work a bit better in Adventurers when he can use Bounty Hunter's Renown, because then Teemo will have so many stats that just him hitting the Nexus so many times will deal a massive amount of damage. But even in challenges, it does a good amount of damage and puts a large amount of puff caps in the enemy deck, putting you in a great position from the very opening round. Next up then, we have the Poro King. Now with the Poro King, I like using this build that you've seen a couple other champions use. So Voidborn Carapace, evolve when any unit dies, grant me its keywords. Corrupted Star Fragment support, kill my supported ally and grant me its stats and keywords. And then the Succubus brand, 1-1, one, one, and when I kill a unit, I summon a random husk. Now for the Poro King, you want to be sure you're having a lot of keywords to start triggering your star powers, scaling up your deck. So these work very well with that, because when you kill a unit, you're summoning a husk. That husk is going to have essentially a random keyword on it really helping you trying to get to those four unique keywords, as well as helping you scale up and even making some space on your board. Normally with Poro Kings, things can get pretty crazy with having a very full board. Corrupted Star Fragment letting you eat some of your units to put all those stats on Poro King can be quite helpful. And again, this can work for any content in the game. Hey, Editor Toast here. Just wanted to add one quick additional detail. One reason why this build is also so good on the Poro King is because of your star power right here. Round end, if an ally died this round, grant your weakest ally 1-1 one, one, and a random keyword that allies don't have. So another reason why you want to be using Corrupted Star Fragment to be intentionally killing at least one of your units every single round, so you're benefiting from this second star power. All right, that's it. Back to the video. All right, next up then, we have Thresh. And Thresh actually utilizes the very same build as well. Really like this build on a lot of different champions. For Thresh, it's very good because Thresh is killing a lot of units and based on his star powers, he scales based on the amount of units killed. So killing your own units with a Corrupted Star Fragment, getting more stats and keywords, also generating more husks from your kills and then gain more keywords from your Voidborn Carapace. All of this works really well together and I actually really enjoy using Thresh for monthly challenges. There's a lot of challenges that kill your whole board and then revive it. Thresh is absolutely amazing with those, especially with this setup of relics. It also works well in adventures as well. Definitely give it a shot. All right, up next then, Varus with a very simple but effective build. So we have a stat relic on him. Him of Valor, when I'm summoned, create a redoubled Valor in hand. It costs three. So right here, fully heal an ally, then double its power and health. And then the Lost Chapter, when I'm summoned, refill your spell mana. Now with Varus, he's able to duplicate all of your single target spells. So normally you're able to have him leveled or nearly leveled by the time you play him. Then when you play him, he's refilling his mana. You're then playing him of Valor, which is going to target your Varus twice, doubling his power and health twice which is why having a stat relic can be nice since you're getting even more stats on your champion since they're getting doubled so many times. And then Varus just attacks and ends the game. Now when he's leveled up, he gets Overwhelm for free. And so it's a very simple way to play Varus and just let him dominate the enemy for you. Now this playstyle can be a little bit boring because every match plays out essentially the exact same way. So while this is definitely effective, there can be some more enjoyable ways to play, such as with builds like this, where you have Archangel Staff refilling your spell mana, Chemtech Duplicator, you're already doubling spells, so doubling spells even more can be quite fun. And then Blade Rack just to make all your units have the best trades possible. Now this isn't gonna be as efficient as the other build, but again, it can be a lot of fun just to have all your spells going off so many times, and it's just a great time. 
All right, next up then, we have Vayne with another simple yet effective build. So first we have a stat relic. Vayne has pretty terrible stats considering her cost and the fact she doesn't have any keywords naturally. So bumping that up a little bit with relics, quite nice. Troll King's Crown, very similar to someone like Samira. Vayne is trying to be very aggressive early and trying to rush down the enemy nexus. So making sure you're not getting blocked out is very important. You can really notice a difference be between when you play with Troll Kings and when you don't. And finally, Crown Guard Inheritance when I level up Rally. Vayne is all about attacking many times in a single turn. So just compounding that with giving her a rally when she levels up is absolutely amazing. And this just focuses on what she's already trying to do, which is rush down the enemy as fast as possible. Up next then, we have Vagar, Super fun champion and a really awesome build here that I highly recommend checking out. So the Scourge's Stash, Plunder, I cost two less. You want to get Vagar on the board as soon as possible so he can start buffing up the damage of your darkness. Can Chemtech duplicate it when you play a spell? If you have six or more mana gems, copy it with these same targets. Vagar really struggled before this to end games, but the Chemtech duplicator really helps you close out games as soon as you hit that six mana mark. Normally you can stock up a couple darknesses for that round and then just nuke the enemy nexus with them as soon as you hit six mana. Then Luden's Tempest, all of your spells and skills deal one extra damage. Great for leveling up your Vagar, and then also great for finishing out the game. Really love playing with him, and he works amazing in the monthly challenges. Highly recommend this build for both adventures and monthly challenges. All right, next up then, we have Vi. Now, this isn't that flashy of a build, but it works. So going for double stat relic, and then also Gatebreaker. What you're trying to do is have Vi in your opening hand. As you're playing all of your cards, you're stacking up to her damage until she can get over that 10 damage. Then you play her, she strikes the Nexus, potentially killing it, but at least guaranteeing that she levels up. Once she levels up, she goes to her max stats, and then you can quickly use her to finish out the game if it's not already over. It's very simple, but it's very effective. As always, switch out the Bounty Hunters for a different stat relic if you're going for the monthly challenges. But this build works great for both. All right, next up then, we have Volibear. Now he's a very powerful champion and a great game finisher. So throwing a Gatebreaker on him, Ludin's Tempest, and then a stat relic works very well. Now, if you want, you can get rid of the Luden's Tempest and just put another stat relic to make the Gatebreaker hit as much as possible. I do enjoy having the Luden's Tempest as quite often, especially if you're playing adventures, the Gatebreaker won't be quite enough to end the game, but then your follow-up attacks with all those Relentless Storms, buffing them all up, will help you close the game out very quickly after that. Again, great regardless of the content you're doing. Next up then, we have Yasuo. So for Yasuo, like going for Tempest Blade, Crown Guard Inheritance, then actually the Grand General's Counterplan. Now this one is only going to be effective every other turn because the Grand General's Counterplan is making that Steel Tempest, so stun a attacking enemy. So obviously this only works when the enemy is attacking, but I like having that extra bit of control. So having this only usable every other round is still pretty nice for me, but if you want to switch this out for like a Stat Relic or something like that, feel free. Tempest Blade though, when I level up, stun all enemies. Very strong because once he levels up, he changes from dealing two damage to striking the enemy. So this will normally kill the target. So normally he stuns the entire enemy board, killing all of them. And then you rally and can normally just attack and end the game. Really effective for monthly challenges as well as adventures. Moving on then, we have Yumi to finish it off. So Gale Force, really the best relic on Yumi because you're just giving whatever you're attached to Scout without the negative side effects. And then normally you can either go for two stat relics or a stat relic and maybe something like Overwhelm. So you can try to make sure you're not getting blocked out. That being said though, sometimes the units you're attached to will have Overwhelm or Elusive already. So sometimes just going for double stat relics would be better. Now Yumi, if you don't know, you play her and you attach to a second unit. And now while she's attached, the only thing that carries over is stats and keywords. So for Yumi, you don't want to go for any real special relics. You just want to go for what keywords and what stats you want to put on the unit. That's why Gale Force is so good on her, because you're just giving them the scout. You're not recalling them at the end of the round. So yeah, really either Gale Force and double stat relics, 
or gale force stat relic and then another keyword relic that you want such as overwhelm to try to end the game as fast as possible all right that is it for the max relic builds this video took a long time to do, so any support is greatly appreciated. If you want to join in the discussion with all things Path of Champions, click our link in the description for our Discord. I hope you all have a great day and a great weekend.